We're on. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Or afternoon. Good afternoon. Good, good evening. Good night. Gentlemen, I have some news. It's time to reveal what this podcast is all about now. <laughs> For it is not actually a podcast about books. That's right. We are the Lizard Overlords. We are here to talk about our Lord and Saviour Xenu. <laughs> oh, God, don't get us in trouble with the Scientologists. Well, we just got kicked off Spotify. Oh, no. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Ellie. Oh, surely they would love to have us on even more. Tell us more about your rantings the, the, of religious beliefs. The opinions of Eloise do not represent the rest of us. <laughs> we uh, love you, Tom Cruise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and as Brayton said, I am Eloise. Thank you for joining us. And joining me, as always, is Brayton and Julian. And we are We're Not Helpful, a podcast about books, our recommendations, thoughts and opinions. Are we? Uh, so, Brayton, do you want to kick things off? You've got stuff lined I've got, up. I've got stuff. We've got. We're going to start today with some viewer mail. Mm -hmm. And I thought we needed just just to spring this on you guys. I thought we needed a um like a little a little theme song for our viewer mail section. Oh, I love so, a theme song. Eloise, yes. you are clearly the best singer out of all of us. Wait, you, we haven't prepared this before. No, we haven't. You're just going to put are up. You ready? The... I've got my <laughs> guitar here. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm going to play a little ditty and I need you to sing along for a um, a viewer mail intro. Are you ready? Right. Okay. Here we go. Okay. And a one, and a two, and a three. I can't hear a thing. <laughs> oh, no. Is it not working? <laughs> Literally cannot hear anything. Oh it's, oh, it's not working. All right. I'll have to plug my guitar in later. Let's just, let's, I'll just. I'll just scat along and if you, you can sing. Shall we just like record something and insert here later? <laughs> insert here later. Sounds good. No, we'll <laughs> keep it. This is this is real. This is live action. Anyway. Viewer mail time. <laughs> that was a bust. <laughs> we have two mails this week. First one is from our dear friend Sylvia. Has emailed Hello, in Sylvia. again. Um, she has some, com I'll just, I'll just read it rather than <laughs> giving you a summary. Good. Excellent. Um, but Julian, there's a, for your interest between these two emails, there is definitely a Stephen King theme. Ooh. Um, considering we were talking last time about bad Stephen King adaptions of which there are several. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this first one from Sylvia is titled Assorted Candies. I like candy. Me too. She says, hello there. First, an apology for the way I wrote my last email. When I heard it read out loud, I realized how clumsy it sounded. I'm so sorry to have flick inflicted that upon yourselves. Uh, don't don't apologize. Sylvia. We didn't notice. We're not smart. It's okay. <laughs> or helpful. And, and you've listened to us talk. We are clearly not masters of the English language. Second, Moby Dick again. The first time I met this book was in history class for my bachelor. The book was mentioned as, read it if you want to understand better this bit. I forgot what the bit was. Of, uh, sorry. <laughs> I forgot what was the bit about because it was tangent to the day's subject. But I remember our teacher gave us a rundown of the story. What was the historical background and the one or two takeaways? I felt curious, so I read the book. After a couple of attempts, because I found the changes in tone jarring. Eloise, you're not alone. Thank God. I, I had the same reaction the first time I tried reading it, and when I finally got to the ending, I felt it took forever. Yes. There are some pages where things happen or characters interact, and then pages of, I swear this is real, and here's all the research I did to convince you, can be something. <laughs> I don't know about the literary discussion because I read it for history. So I'm looking forward to the Moby Dick special episode of your podcast. Just one final detail. Mocha Dick, and I hope I'm saying that right. Mocha? Mocha? M-O-C-H-A? Mocha. Mocha, thank you. Mocha Dick was a white sperm whale who lived by the Chilean coast near Mocha Island and had several encounters with whaling ships. Do what you will with that piece of information. I think is that the the true story it's based on? Yes, I, I was I going remember, to look that up. Yes, actually. I remember reading something about that, and yes, it, Moby Dick is based partly, like more inspired by 
um, Mocha Dick. Well, if we want to just put a pause in the listener emails there for a second, let's uh, talk about the exciting news that I had this afternoon. <laughs> I finally finished Moby Dick. Huzzah! Yeah. <laughs> uh, finally. You might already probably be aware of that because I posted it on Facebook um, before we recorded. So by the time you hear this, uh, hopefully you have seen the post. But yes, it's done. It's gone. <laughs> it's over. I can see the Shire and- again, Sam. Um, and yes, Brayton and I will do a special uh, episode where we talk about it, review it, where I probably will rant for half an hour. Um, so we will put a pin on that now to not take away from the yes. rest of the episode. This will today. probably be the last time we discuss Moby Dick in any sort of detail until then. Thank God. Okay, we'll move on to other things. Um. Okay, she goes on. Third, my most hated adaption is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Hmm. It's an old movie from 1954, and it's honestly an insult to Jules Verne. <laughs> <laughs> my favourite adaption so far is Good Omens. Yay! Though it's it not a movie, it's a series. Very hard at not talking about that <laughs> last week. <laughs> you did so well. Very good at not talking did so well. <laughs> As a movie, maybe Sleepwalkers. Oh. I believe Stephen King. At least the movie made sense without the book, has no glaring faults, and is entertaining. I'm not a huge fan of movie adaptions, though. Hmm. Fourth, I think the main thing with adaptions is how much the filmmakers care about the source material. Hmm. Cutting bits for the sake of clarity or making changes because it's, a, because it's a difficult medium, sure. Throwing away the story and intentions to write an entirely unrelated thing, just keeping the title, no thanks. I'd rather watch an original movie. At least I won't be disappointed. Also. Oh, sorry, before you go on, yep. I just suddenly had a really good um, example of that. So keeping the title, but throwing away the rest of the book. World War Z. Like. Oh, yes. That a big example of mm. let's just keep the title and it's about zombies and that's it. And <laughs> now, clearly you've never seen the lawnmower man. Uh, no, I haven't. No. <laughs> Literally, the only thing is the title. <laughs> does he mow lawns? Not in the movie, he does not. No, <laughs> or the book either. I'm assuming. Oh, well, the book he does. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Part for some of it. And Julian, wasn't there something sort in of. the in the latest um, Pet Cemetery movie? They changed a whole character's storyline. Yeah. Oh, ju- oh no, Julian's. Uh, yeah. Okay. We, the less the less said about that, the better. Let's I not. Guess. Hold, he's right. lighting Let's a torch. Not. He's grabbing <laughs> his pitchfork. <laughs> All right. Um, well, we're going to uh, change this most important plot point <laughs> just because we can. Why fucking do Pet Cemetery then? I won't rant. I won't rant. <laughs> All right. She goes on. Also, if something is too tied to the medium, maybe it's best to leave it as is. Mm. And if something will end up with half of the plot and a third of the characters gone because of time constraints, maybe make a series instead. Not everything needs to be a movie. Well, that's all. Hope you all have a lovely day and my deepest apologies to the fine gentleman who wrote before me and got so discourteously (laughs) ignored. Kind regards, Sylvia. Have we heard from Richie again this we week? Have, we have not. Oh, I'm disappointed. Clearly he's just abandoned the show now. <laughs> he has been unwell. Oh, uh, he's better he? now, but he, he has been unwell. Oh, um, I do Richie, have a question I hope you're okay. for Sylvia. Are you talking about Sleepwalkers with the movie with all the cats? Because I find it odd that anyone anywhere considers that a good film. Um, so let us let us know. Wait, the, I thought that wasn't based on a book. I thought that was just an original story idea that Stephen King wrote for a film. Or am I thinking of a different so, one? No, no, I thought it was too. So maybe we're wrong and it's not a Stephen King hmm, okay. story. I mean, there's a very <clears throat> good chance we're wrong. It's in the title. <laughs> yeah, we aren't very helpful when it comes no, to No, we are things. not. No, we should do research before. I like Sylvia's emails, so please keep writing to us. Yes, yes thank it, you, it, Sylvia. It's so nice to hear from. Can can we say across the pond? I, I don't know in Australia, but it's it's nice to hear someone writing to us that's not saying please stop, please stop now. <laughs> yeah, look, we get too many of those emails every week. <clears throat> well, we won't. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. No, we're too stubborn. 
<laughs> uh, shall I move on to our second email? Yes. Yes. This is from a person we may know, Adrian. Ah, <clears throat> uh, hello, never Adrian. <laughs> never, heard no, never heard of him. Never heard of him. Not ringing a bell. <laughs> uh, his is entitled A Glaring Oversight. Oh, no. Uh, Julian, I believe you will have some things to say about this one. Yes. Good day. Who is this Adrian? I don't know who he is. Yeah, okay. Good day. I could to go the... on. <laughs> Good day to all three of you beautiful humans. I listened to the podcast this week and really enjoyed the discussion on movie adaptions. I completely agreed with Eloise's take on the Harry Potter movies. As someone who hasn't read the books, I found the later movies really tough to follow. In fact, I watched The Half-Blood Prince and felt as though there was a half a movie missing, which is not an unfair That's... reaction. Vindication. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> the reason for this email, however, is that I felt there was a glaring oversight in your discussion of movie adaptions, especially Stephen King adaptions. <laughs> well, if we spent our time on Stephen King adaptions, then Julian would have just spoken for an hour and a half. And That's wouldn't true. have gotten to anything else. Um, Julian, can you guess what movie he's referring to the langley is i, I don't know <laughs> it just i mean you have, have we watched have we watched a stephen king oh yes i know exactly what film he's referring <laughs> to and it, because it's not a bad adaptation in any way shape or form it is possibly the best stephen king film ever made except for the last two minutes we are of course talking about the shawshank redemption Yes. Is that, no, is that what no, we're talking no. about? No. <laughs> no. There was not one mention of the cinematic masterpiece that is Maximum Overdrive. Ah! Oh. <laughs> How can you bypass such a classic, a possessed truck, cheap special effects, and Emilio all under the unsteady director, directorial hand of Stephen King himself? <laughs> Julian, we're I... disappointed in you. <laughs> I felt without mention of this film, your discussion was delightful but incomplete. Much love, Adrian. To 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 our defense, Maximum Overdrive as a film has so so very much surpassed the short story it is based on that I can't even consider it an adaptation anymore. Um, <laughs> it really is its own entity, and it is a thing of startlingly crapulent brilliance. Um, and if you've never watched it, please do. Okay, I I had to when I read this email, I looked up the. I've never seen the film. <laughs> Neither have I. Oh, you're and in for I, a treat. Excellent. I looked I looked up just the Wikipedia page, and there are some treats in the description of production, yes. especially especially this. I don't know if you've heard this story, Julian. It says at a fan screening in 2021, Jock Brandis, the film's gaffer, told the audience that King rode a motorcycle from Maine to Wilmington so he could ride alongside semi-trucks on the highway. He wanted to get a better feel for how terrifying big rigs could be when he was in close proximity, and to better know their loud sounds and movements. When King arrived at the studio on his bike for the initial production meeting, the security guards wouldn't let him through the front gate because they did not believe he was part of any production taking place on the lot. His appearance was disheveled, and he was rambling on about a film he was to direct involving killer trucks that had come alive due to a space comment. <laughs> I can I side with the security guns there. To be fair, <laughs> he was on bucket loads of cocaine. So he may not have been very coherent at the time. I feel like that's not fair. <laughs> From what I've heard, um, the film sound sounds like it was directed by someone on bucket loads of cocaine. Yes. Oh, he self, self admitted at the time that he was. Um, and when asked if he will ever make another film, he says, Have you not seen Maximum Overdrive? <laughs> I have. And heard so, that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah. I, I was looking at the cast and, like, oh my God, like Emilio Estevez. Yeah. Yerd, Yerdley Smith. Yeah. Ah. The voice, yeah. of, the voice of Lisa, Lisa Simpson, Simpson is in this. And. Um, Giancarlo Esposito. Yeah, I'm probably saying that completely quite, wrong. Quite the cast. Hmm. Like how he would have been very young. If you don't know who I'm talking about, he was um Gus Fring in Breaking Bad, and um 
Moff Gideon in The Mandalorian. Oh, yes, that guy. And he right. was in this. I'm like, oh my God, like there's quite a stacked cast here. You have to start somewhere. I wonder if just the name Stephen King kind of brought them in. More than Well, likely. it was in his prime. So thank you for the email, Adrian. Very and entertaining. <laughs> if anyone out there has seen Maximum Overdrive or sees it after this, please let us know your thoughts. Because it, it's apparently terrible. <laughs> has 24, oh, so 24% on Metacritic and 14% on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. Full ACDC soundtrack. Yes. Oh, it's yes. a classic. Yep. Um, audiences have apparently rated the film D+. Plus. <laughs> Which is that? Is that generous, Julian? Peons. It wouldn't know a good thing if it bit him in the ass. It got me. It's an A plus film. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. A. It's an A film. The ending lets it down. Okay. okay. Hate it when an ending lets things down. Okay. That is our. That's our viewer emails for the week. So, what are we talking about this week? What are we talking about? Well, all of us have kind of dabbled in writing mm-hmm. and so that. So I thought I have scoured the internet, mostly um, Reddit, if I'm being 100% honest. <laughs> Probably are writing. Definitely are writing. And I thought it would be fun to go through some of the worst writing advice that I could find on that website. Ooh, I like it. And I can't now, think of any specific bad pieces of writing advice I've received, so I haven't really managed yes. to think of anything to talk about except for one piece of uh, of advice that I read recently, which I've yet to try out, so I don't know if it's bad advice or not. Okay. So they're, the, these are not bad – well, these are not necessarily bad advice given out on Reddit. These are people talking about bad advice that they have received. Right. Ah. And, and some of them, some of them are quite, I don't know, controversial. Hmm. Maybe that's maybe that's the wrong word, but you could definitely argue one way or another with them. Um, well, keeping keeping with the Stephen King theme, apparently um, King, the first the first one I'll talk about. Apparently, King said in his book on writing, which I think Julian you've read. Yeah. Um, he said some. Maybe you can fill me in. He said something about not using adverbs. Yes, use them sparingly. Sparingly, yes. And apparently some people have taken that as never use an adverb. No. Well, he says himself he does use them on occasion, but um, he doesn't like to use adverbs. Uh, Because the word that comes after, if you need to put an adverb in front of it, use a better word. Okay. And apparently, from what I've read, some people have also expanded that to not just include adverbs, but also adjectives. How on earth can I've you? Never heard King say that ever. The... <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think this was a King thing. Apparently, people have taken that advice and have then also heard other people spouting, "Don't use adverbs or adjectives in your writing because if you need to kind of flourish your writing in that way, it's not good enough." The, ah. the use of the use of adverbs comes from him saying, "If why would you say someone ran quickly unless there's something specific to the quickness of the running? Yes, they're going quickly because they're running. Or if something happened suddenly, well, of course it happened suddenly because it hadn't happened before. So it just happened. So adding a suddenly or a quickly or a what have you in, in front or after your verb is a little bit, superfluous to demand a lot of the time it doesn't unless it's very specific yeah because i'm thinking that usually you would use adjectives to sort of expand the the feeling about what's happening surely yeah and and there is a time and a place for an adverb Mm. um but you know to say something he ran quickly down the street what does that actually add to the sentence they're running anyway so we know that they're going quickly so why add the quickly unless there's a specific reason to talk about the speed of the run, right? Why, why put in the advert? And that's what he means by don't use adverbs or use them sparingly. Okay. okay. So, what was the other thing that people then 
tacked onto that, Brayton? Adjectives. Adjectives, right. I'm going to say that's just dumb. To say (laughs) don't use adjectives, (laughs) you you have to. Otherwise, there's no description. (laughs) Yes. So how what would what would you rate that piece of advice? Is is that bad advice? Bad or, advice. Bad yes. advice. On a scale of one to dumb, dumb to better. <laughs> Wait, what's our scale? Dumb, dumb to good. Dumb to good. That's just bad advice. Right. Don't use adjectives. Sorry. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> next one. Or, or, I'm sure the grammar nerds out there are loving this. Mm. Okay. What about what about this one? Someone and I'm quoting I'm quoting directly from the comment here. Boost someone was said to boost my credibility as a writer by using bigger words and fancy syntax. Fucking toffee. <laughs> I have a good example. Moby yep. Dick. <laughs> um I was I, I included that one because um yeah, there was. There's another one that kind of goes goes with this one that I read. That if it's hard for you to write, it's hard for the reader to read. Mm. Yeah, I would agree. Yep. Yep. Okay. I, like, I think sometimes if you're going to use complicated syntax, sparingly is fine. Mm. But yeah, th- I think that's one of the reasons why I really struggled with Moby Dick, for example, was because of the fact that it was like that all through the book. Everything was like symbolism and it meant something and it was representative of something else and it was all about descriptions and imagery. And then I was like, well, I don't actually know what is specifically going on because I can't mm. you know, work my way through the layers of what you're actually saying here. Yeah. Um, so, yes. For me, it's 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 like those teachers that brag about how hard their classes are. My classes are so hard, everyone fails. That's not the brag you think it is. My book's so full of big words and stuff, people struggle to understand it. Mm. That's not the brag you think it is. No. Yeah. No. I mean, there is a time and a place, and if the context <clears throat> of the story can support a character... Mm. using big fancy words maybe it's a character trait that they're a bit of a pretentious so and so and they do you mm. do use those big words but if you're using overly fancy writing just because you want to show off that you've memorized the thesaurus then that's just is it do you think it's almost like talking down to your readers that only certain people can understand my books or my oh, I think it depends on the person as well. If a person is doing it deliberately because they feel like it makes them seem like a better person, then yes, it's mm. probably talking down. But it, other people might be taking it, uh, might have taken that advice perhaps and not understood why it could be damaging because you're you're losing readership or viewership then. Yeah. Uh, Eloise, you remember Nick. Right. Yes, I do remember Nick. And no, Brayton, you never met Nick. He was an old friend of ours, and he spoke like a dictionary uh, made love to a thesaurus. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh my god! He, yes. <laughs> yeah, not because he wanted to sound better than you, but it was literally just the way he spoke. Mm. And so yeah. I think if that is your natural voice, it's naturally going to appeal to a specific sort of reader. But if you are doing it just to sound better than to make your, so your stuff sound seem more pretentious or highbrow, then you're just going to turn your audience off. I think it's a terrible idea. Yeah. You'll probably okay. draw in specific people who like that type of thing, but it won't be able to talk to, you know, a large mass of people perhaps. Mm. Um, but, yeah, yeah, like so, I said, sparingly is good. <laughs> yep, sparingly, definitely. And character traits. I liked that that thought, Brayton. Yeah, yeah, like if you if you've got there, I mean, like exactly with the um adverbs thing, there's a time and a place for that type of language. Yeah. Um, and but it's more about knowing when to use and also knowing what your who your audience is. Like yeah. If you're, mm. if you're going if you're going out there with the intention to write like a young adult fantasy novel, mm. there's probably not a place for that kind of fancy flourishy language where compared to if you're writing a book for maybe more mature readers yeah definitely know who your audience audience is and know 
what type of book you're actually writing as well. Mm. Um, and I'm interested, Julian, when you said that you agree with the, if it's hard for you to write, it's hard for the reader to read. Because mm. this is this is one I saw that people were actually disagreeing with, that they they thought that if it's hard for you to write, not necessarily if it's hard for you to write, it's hard for the reader to read, but it's more that, um, I guess, taking... If it's hard for you to write, it just doesn't. It doesn't mean that it's going to be hard for the reader to read. If that makes sense, it just means that you might be struggling with certain scenes or certain. It, okay, points. yeah. So if it's hard for you to write and you're struggling to actually put, you know, pen to paper, that's different mm. for, you know, you making it hard on yourself to use words you wouldn't normally use. Um, so I think there's a def there's a difference there. If if it if you're struggling to put pen on paper, and each word is a struggle. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be hard for your audience to follow. But if you're struggling to make yourself sound better than you normally would be, then I think it's going to be hard for your audience as well. Because if you don't understand what you're writing, yeah, if you're using words that you're not comfortable using, that's going to put your audience at ease because that does come through in your writing. And that comes through in any art. If you don't know what you're doing, that comes across. Mm. Um sometimes subtly, sometimes overtly. So I think if you're struggling to be something you're not as a writer or an artist of any kind, your audience isn't going to follow it properly. It's going to be hard for them to understand what you're trying to get across. They might understand the words and they might be able to read the book, but they won't get what it was you were trying to do, I don't think. Okay. Good. And that actually segues really well into the next one, which is is something that I've heard said as both good writing advice and also after doing a bit of research as bad writing advice which is write what you know oh okay so the it let me give you some context yeah so it's often said exactly what you were saying julian about if you're not comfortable with the language and not comfortable with um I guess the setting or something like that if you don't know that from life then how are you expected to portray that um what's the word realistically or believably for your readership your readers but at the same time people were saying well hang on if i'm writing a book set in the 1930s depression i've never experienced that i don't know those things personally i have to go out and do research to do that or if i'm a mm -hmm. if i'm a um, cis male writer writing about a pregnant a pregnant woman I've never experienced that myself, but so I don't know exactly what that is, but I can still write about it. Mm. That's a really interesting one because, um, like, we see it a lot in terms of how do we get the voices of people who have experienced certain things out into literature Um unless we give those people the opportunity to be heard. So I'm talking about like people of colour, uh, feminist writings and trans stories, uh, mm. like probably the three big main things that um, we don't see enough of because historically speaking, most writers tend to be cis white men. Uh, like, and I'm not trying to say that as a blanket thing, that's just historical content con context where you know nine times out of ten you're going to get a writer to be published because they are male or they're well known or, or they're white so they have those specific experiences that then are being missed because those types of writers either don't want to write about them or don't think that they can write about them or um don't branch out into those types of stories. On the one hand, I think it's important that you do give voice to those experiences, even if you don't or you haven't experienced them yourself, because I think we need more diversity in our stories. Um, but at the same time, I do understand that those types of stories are very personal and can really only be told by the people who experience them. Um, like I hear that a lot, especially when it comes to trans stories. Like, and we've seen it a lot, especially when like trans characters are being played by 
cis people and if people don't understand what I say by cis I mean like someone who is uh, assigned a gender at birth and then uh maintains that gender Mm -hmm. um so I can see it from both sides it's a very interesting discussion to have um personally I think everyone should just be able to branch out to write whatever they want to write but also if you're going to be writing about something specific, then you need to do your research and that you need to have someone close to you who and who can possibly even co-write those types of things with you to make sure that the voice is authentic. Um, we see that a lot when it comes, we're in Australia, obviously, we see that a lot when it comes to Indigenous um, views and writing if if you're not a First Nation person, then it's usually really important to have um, the voice of a First Na- Nation person with you to construct what it is that you're actually doing. Um, personally, I think it, it's probably better to actually have the First Nation people doing that rather than you taking it over yourself. But it's one of those balancing acts of where we are in history in terms of how we actually get that out there. So hopefully I've made sense and not offended anyone. <laughs> In, with that it's a very complicated issue it's the same it's the same kind of argument they're having about in like movie and tv at the moment that should a gay character only be portrayed by a gay actor mm. or should a trans character only be portrayed by a trans actor it's a very um complicated issue and i'm not i'm not going to put too much into it because i'm obviously a cis white male i obviously don't have that lived experience. Yeah. Um, but if I was writing a story about a trans character or a LGBT character, I would definitely have to reach out to some people and sort of talk to them about it and what that experience is yeah. before. I before think like being collaboration is collaboration is the key that if you're going to be um writing about that type of thing, then you definitely need to collaborate with someone who who knows what it is, um, what it feels like, have they experienced it, and even, like, multiple people as well. Because, obviously, one person's experience is still going to be different from, like, another person's experience. So it can't be um, the blanket, this is how it is, because, obviously, you know, that's not how anything works, really. Um, One example I had I have is when I read Tomorrow When the War Began, that the Tomorrow series, and, oh, gosh, who's the author? I know he's a male author. Um, Marston. Thank you, yes. And, like, the the arguably the main character, the main protagonist is, is a female and she's a female teenager. And I just found the scenes where she starts having sex with one of the other um, characters in the story. Like, I, I don't know. I... It's important for that kind of story to be told in terms of a young woman um, experiencing certain things and and taking power for it and, and whatnot and having, like, a strong female lead. But at the same time, I still kind of felt a bit weird that it was, like, a middle-aged dude writing it. I don't know. <laughs> I think I'm completely missing the point I was trying to make before as well. <laughs> but that was just kind of, like, my experience reading the book that it just kind of felt a bit weird knowing that it sort of came from that perspective. And I would like to know what he did in terms of research to really get into the mindset of a 16-year-old girl. Like, did he speak to other 16-year-old girls at all or did he just write the story from his from his brain? <laughs> and I think we can say there is no clear answer to this but also at the same time it shouldn't it shouldn't be a clear cut like getting back to what the advice was like write only what you know mm. i think that's bad advice because it's good to actually go out and learn more and you can actually have a character experiencing those things in your story if that's if that's where you're yeah. kind of going with it i i think also we have twisted this only write what you know to be maybe something that it, it was never intended to be. When when I hear someone say, write what you know, <clears throat> we're talking about experiences. We're talking about things we understand, things we've experienced, love, life, happiness, loss, um, those kinds of things. And so authors tend to, to theme their books around 
those experiences that they understand fundamentally from having lived through those types of moments. To say right only what you know, I think, is is a very dangerous thing to do because if you do that, most of the books we have now that we love that we consider classics wouldn't exist. You know, Tolkien obviously is one example. Right only what you know. Well, he didn't experience Middle Earth. You know, he didn't yeah, how on earth could you write and, fantasy and or things. science fiction if you? <laughs> but if you <clears throat> then if you look at someone like Stephen King's writings where a lot of his books are circled around childhood and friendship because those are the things that he cherishes from his own life. Mm. And so that's what I feel like when we say write, write what you know. And if you look at books, there tends to be an, a, a type of self-insert in a lot of ways as well. Mm. Authors will tend to, and I'm not saying don't necessarily make the main character themselves, mm. but there's bits of personalities in each of the characters from themselves, from those who are closest to them and the people that they've known all their lives because they have such an impact on on the author. So writing what you know, I think, is writing about your your experiences and what is what is personal to you um, and then putting that around some sort of plot. And so it's it's the journey that you know, I suppose. Do you think it's good advice to give to someone who is just starting out? Like they've just started, like, oh, I want to be a writer, I don't know what I want to write, and that's the first thing you tell them then as a really good way to get into writing in the first place as an exercise perhaps? I think, yeah, it's you. you an author should never be trying to recreate the, the wheel. Mm. Never try and recreate the wheel. It's write what you know is an easy way because you've had experiences, even if you're an 18 year old kid, you've had experiences that have brought you through those 18 years. Use that, you know, use that knowledge, use that feelings, use those experiences and those moments to create characters that are alive. And that's writing what you know. Um, I don't think I know many people who write and step back and go, that character is, I cannot, tell you anything about that character i don't know where they came from most likely we ever go yeah there's a little bit of this person a little bit of that person in, in this character and so i think it's great advice to an author starting out because where, wherever you are now something's brought you there and people have brought you there and so use that i think to create real characters going on a real journey everything else you know plot plot is kind of secondary to that So what do we say? Do we say this is good advice or bad advice or a little bit depending on the context? Don't write only what you know because then you are pigeonholing yourself into a very narrow world. Yep. Yep. But I think it's good advice to say stick with what you know, you know, start from what you know and then build a plot around that. Okay. Let's see. All right. This person said they were told that you are not a writer if you are not writing every day. No, that's bad advice. <laughs> <laughs> Straight away. Yeah, that's to, no. Don't don't tell people that. That's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Sometimes it takes time for for inspiration to strike, and you shouldn't force it. You should not force yourself to sit down and write if you're not feeling it, because we're not robots, and we're not like creative outpouring creatures like sometimes days just have to be days like that that's too much pressure to say oh you're not going to be a writer if you don't write every day okay i have a counter to that (laughs) oh no okay (laughs) apparently neil gaiman Mm. spoke on this exact topic i know i know your love for neil gaiman i do love him yep um he said this exact he said a similar thing about waiting for inspiration to strike. Mm. He said, if you are a professional author, a professional writer, you have to write every day. If you wait around for inspiration to strike, nothing might ever happen. So he oh, him, uh, he himself, that's his opinion. I think that George R.R. Martin would have something to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there has to be a middle ground between someone like a James Patterson who releases a book every week and um, <laughs> George Martin who releases a book, what, every, what is it, decade now? Uh, we're up to, uh, yeah. I think we're up to 12 what? years this year since his oh, last, since oh the Dance God. with Dragons. Still, yeah. 
I guess. <laughs> I guess. I guess. I mean, let me let me clarify. There's a difference between if you are if writing is your only job. If you are like the Neil Gaiman's or the um, James Pattersons and stuff like that, where writing is your only job, then part of your job would be to get that word count in each day. Maybe each day you don't hit that 2,000, 3,000 words, whatever it is. Um, but at the same time, if you're a professional, you can't just be waiting around for that stroke of genius to hit. Whereas if you're just starting out and it's more your hobby, then you can still, in my opinion, you can still call yourself a writer, even if that is only sitting down a couple of times a week and getting down a few hundred words. I, I would I would agree. I think if it's your job, if that is your primary income, um, then you you've got to get the word. Yeah, if you wait for the right moment, you know that may never that may never happen. Mm. So get the words down, even if they're not great words, and then you can always edit, draft, do what you need to do. I yeah, suppose, but, but also, mm. like, if it's a job, then it's still you should still be bound by standard work hours. So you should still be giving yourself weekends, for example, well, time off. I guess, like the I don't know, the idea of <laughs> writing every day. Like, no one can write three hundred and sixty-five days a year. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being a bit too pedantic about. I guess it. you have to define <laughs> writing. If someone puts down one sentence, yeah, five words, yeah. is that? considered writing for the day yes do, do you achieve your writing goal if you've just written a sentence <laughs> well, here's the thing and there's a whole there's a thing on um booktube at the moment well not at the moment it's been going on for months now of book youtubers trying different authors writing routines mm. and a lot of them are well there's no clear-cut way of this is how you should write a book and this this is actually another piece of advice that I had found that people are people telling other people there is only one way to write a book. Yeah, again, no, there's not. <laughs> of course not. Everyone is different. And whatever works for you works for you. Like you have some authors like Brandon Sanderson, who writes books in his spare time. Mm. He goes on holiday and writes a book. That guy is a machine. He's <laughs> he's pushing out like three, four thousand words a day. Obviously, that's not sustainable for everyone. That's what works for him. I know other very famous authors only push out a thousand words a day, but I would never say that one is a better author than another or a better writer than another because they don't hit that word count. Going back to Neil Gaiman, actually, because he was encouraging someone uh, in a post that I saw a while ago, and he said that he wrote Coraline in... 60 words per day brackets, basically. So he wrote the story of Coraline 60 words a day until it was done, basically. So uh, so it comes down to quality over quantity as well, I think. So going back to the, we were joking about one sentence, I suppose if you like put a lot of hard work into that one sentence and you really like made that sentence exactly how you wanted it to be, then sure, that would be considered good writing for the day if that's all you could manage. Because obviously like we need to take into account everyone, their writing styles, their their circumstances, their environments, their mental health, all of that sort of thing. I don't know. I yeah, seem to, we seem to have a lot of varying opinions there. So I don't know if it's I, I think it's mean to say you're not a writer if you don't write every day. Mm. Yeah. Um, because I think that puts a lot of pressure on people, especially people starting out. Uh, but take what you will if you think it is good to write every single day, even if it's only yep. a small amount. You know. Yep, even if it's hundred words a day, even like you said, a sentence. You're still writing, you're still practicing that craft. Does, does writing in your head count or does it have to get out onto the paper? Because <laughs> I wrote like a whole thing today in my head and I haven't had a chance to get to the computer yet. And well, I feel like that's not going to happen tonight. <laughs> well, actually, that does seg segue very nicely into the next next Ooh. one I've got written here, which is you <clears throat> can't write a book unless you have an outline. Uh, mm. I disagree. Yes, that's, this is the whole pantser versus planner debate. Mm. Um, so if anyone out there doesn't know, a planner is obviously someone that plans out an entire outline of the book 
before they actually start writing the book proper. Whereas mm-hmm. a pantser just starts writing. They may have an idea of where it's going. They may not, but they just start writing and see, see what happens. I'm very much a pantser sometimes. I can I suddenly get inspiration for certain things of how to start stuff off. And then I regret not being a planner because I get like to, you know, two scenes later, I'm like, ah, fuck, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I wish I planned. I'm so lazy. Ah. I so I am I take exactly the, first, the same. I take the that advice to heart and it makes me feel bad not being a planner and I like I keep saying to myself I need to actually sit down and outline something so I actually know what it is that I'm doing who my characters are where I'm going with the story rather than and then and then I get into like this vicious cycle of well I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to planning so then I don't do the planning and then I don't do any writing at all so I think that's bad advice for me because it makes me feel bad (laughs) um yeah there's a hard I'm I'm very much the same like I've said in previous shows, I think that I've started and stopped many stories because I get two pages in and don't know what's going to happen next. Mm. But having said that, every time I've sat down to try and plan a story, I find the planning process really tedious and just really boring. Yep. And the inspiration is kind of gone by the time I can get to a stage where I actually get to writing. Does that also have something to do with our neurodiversities as well, though? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) I fully know it's because of that. But, um, yeah, but I don't think telling people you have to have an outline is not the right approach. I think finding what works for you is the better way. Yes. Maybe telling people it's a good idea to have an outline so that you know where you're going, but it's not necessary if you're good at just coming up with things. And I think we spoke, Julian, we've spoken about Stephen King is a pantser, isn't he? Yeah. The, the, this whole idea of outlining a book and look like it, it's going to work for some people because they need to have that structure to them and it's not going to work for others. And we talk about starting something and not knowing where it's going and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you get three or four pages or three or four chapters into a story and that's as far as you can get with it, and that's okay. Maybe that story is told. Maybe it didn't have anywhere else to go. Fundamentally, writer has one job, and it's to answer the question of what happened next. Mm-hmm. Tell us what happened next. And sometimes you get to a point when the audience says to you, what happened next, and you say, nothing. It's done. I, there's there's nothing to say next. And th- there's nothing wrong with that. I think we're made to feel guilty if you don't have a what happened next, if you don't have an answer to that, and maybe that's just not a story that needs to be told in the end. Um, and so that's okay. And, and if you want that outline, make that outline. If if you if you can't make an outline, then don't. Don't feel like you have to. And don't feel bad if if you don't have an answer to what happened next. There's, a, there's always another story to tell where you will have an answer to what happened next because in the end, outline or not, that's your one job. Tell and, us what happened next. And just expanding on on that idea as well, <clears throat> not everything that you write, like it doesn't it doesn't all have to be finished. It, it can just be, well, this is how you you practiced to get to that next story that does have a that does get finished, for example. Mm. Like this idea yeah. of if, you know, there's so many people out there who want to be a writer and who say, I've got this book inside of me. And then the reason why I think a lot of people don't pursue that is because, yeah, they get to, you know, three chapters in and then suddenly don't realise, don't know where they're going. Uh, and then they just give it up because they think, oh, well, I failed because I couldn't finish that story. It's like, well, no, it just, you started learning how to do something. You gave that a go. Now, it's okay to start again with something else because you've already had that practice and experience beforehand and then maybe this time you'll get five chapters in or seven chapters in or 18 chapters in, for example. I don't know. Is maybe that it good just advice wasn't a story that had to be told. <laughs> and it, happened, it, it happens to even famous authors that I read an interview <clears throat> or watched an interview with Margaret Atwood who mm, um, Handmaid's wrote Tale. The Handmaid's Tale. And she was talking about how she abandoned a book 200 pages into it oh, okay. because she realized that the story was going nowhere. She got to this point and she knew these characters and loved these characters, 
but they were just kind of going around in circles and the story wasn't moving on and she realized that she had to let this one go and start the next one huh. yeah. so it, ha it happens to everyone and then you have authors like again brandon sanderson um who plans book series down to books in the future he's currently one of his ongoing series is the stormlight archives mm. which he's planning to have 10 books in the series and before he had even written book one i hope i'm rem remembering this correctly before he had written book one he had planned out the first five books in the series so he knew exactly where he was going it, like yes there's little deviations here and there when things happen but for the overarching storyline he knew where those first five books were going. And I've even heard of some authors that will write a outline of the story, then break that outline into chapters, then break each chapter down to like five to 10 to 20 dot points of each step, what happens in each chapter, and then break that down even further oh, okay. into like little sub things before they actually start writing. Yep. And if that works for you, that is absolutely fine. But but I guess we're saying that you don't have to do that if that doesn't work for you. Yep. So again, Oops. we're saying, um, yeah, either either write an outline or don't. It doesn't really matter yeah. for you. And don't make people feel bad if they don't do it. <laughs> and don't you feel bad if you don't fit into one of those categories? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Do whatever works. And it might take some experimentation. Write yeah. a story with an outline. Write a story without an outline. Do half and half. See what happens. Kevin Kevin J. Anderson writes his books while hiking. He has, <laughs> How does he, he, has he has a little recorder. Ah. Oh. And he talks as he hikes. And that's how he writes his books. Oh, I should do that. I'd have to get through all the wheezing and puffing first. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if you're doing it as long as he's been writing books for, you're probably really fit. Yeah. And but yeah, whatever works for you, do some experimentation, whatever works for you. Um, I think, I think that that segs nicely to what will probably be our last little bit of bad advice that I saw. Mm -hmm. And that is tailoring your book based on one person's critique. Mm. I have read a lot of, stories online about how they gave this to a reader and it was essentially just uh look i know you're writing a fantasy action book here but i was more interested in the romance chapter so i think you should turn this into a romance book yeah no that's that's just being a bad beta <laughs> yes and es essentially it's that thing of knowing when to listen to your beta readers and when to kind of I guess gently say that no, I'm going to leave that piece of advice rather than taking on every critique and trying to match it to make this one person happy. I think it's also someone is stepping over the mark of what a beta is anyway. Like a beta is supposed to be there to help make sure, like with uh, they're essentially like a publisher, I suppose, like editing structure, making sure like things make sense that you know, the past and present tense are being used correctly. They can kind of give suggestions about, oh, okay, maybe this story beat should be here rather than here, but then saying, mm. I prefer romance over the science fiction part of your story. No, that they're overstepping the mark. <laughs> yes. One horrible thing that I read, um, read while I was researching this is someone said they were writing a medieval, a, medi a, a book set in the medieval times, and they said that there needs there needs to be some I'm not going to say the word but a ro word that rhymes with it there needs to be some grape in this book because having a uh, book set in medieval times without grape is unrealistic. No. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness. Yeah, you that's know what? horrible. There's a difference between, for example, Outlander and Poldark for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could do because... a whole thing about Outlander. Oh my, well, maybe we should, as one of our little, as one of our little spin-off episodes, we'll rant about Outlander for an hour. Oh, I feel like we'd have to read the Outlander stories. Though. No, I'm just going off the book, off the okay. TV show. <laughs> I'm not, 
Those books are huge. Yes. So for anyone who doesn't really know, Outlander and Poldark are both set probably around about the same time. It's like the like late 1700s. Um, and, yes, in Outlander, terrible things happen to the female protagonists in the show constantly mm. all the way through. Poldark, none of that has happened ever yet so far, and I do keep actually joking to my husband about how it's <laughs> Outlander without the R word. Um, so... <laughs> So, no, th- th- that is completely incorrect to tell someone it's unrealistic if this thing doesn't happen. Like, yep. and yeah. I think, and I think the advice is the, the, the bad advice there is that you need to listen to every critique and tailor it to match what that person says. Yes. Sometimes you can just not listen to the, to the critique that you're being given because it, in the end, it's your story. And it, you are the one who has control over it. Yep. Get a new beta. Yeah. <laughs> You're clearly not a master at it. <laughs> ah, ah, you've been point. waiting for 10 I've minutes been to say that. I've so long to get that one out. <laughs> Saw your um, face earlier. <laughs> yeah, like, like you said, writing writing is such, a, such an inherently personal thing. Any form of artistic expression is such a personal thing. And it's it's your story, and you should never let anyone dictate to you what sort of story you should write. Now, you can take advice and say, maybe, you know, don't incorporate this particular thing into it, or maybe you shouldn't write that scene, or maybe use less swear words, or whatever it might be. I think you can take that critique from someone under your belt, absolutely. But to have someone say to you, oh, you're writing a story about this, but I like stories about this, so maybe make your story about this instead. So, well, no, no, fuck you, buddy. This is my story. You want to read stories about this? Go and read stories about that. Yes. This is mine. I'm writing it for me first. Yes. Uh, so never let anyone dictate what sort of story you mm. should write. And there is a difference between constructive critique of going, I thought the plot was a bit disjointed or this character's motivations were unclear. Mm, I think that's yes. perfectly legitimate. Yeah. But saying that's fine. Yeah. But saying you need to change this entire section of your story because I personally didn't like it. That's just being a bad beta reader. Yeah. Um, it's, it's your story. You write the story you want to write. Mm. Listen to the feedback when it's saying this doesn't make sense or, you know, should you be including those particular scenes in this sort of novel, things like that, mm. but not what you write. That's yours. Mm. Yeah. What, like, I know I've, I, I don't like it, but I keep coming back to it. <laughs> Moby Dick <laughs> said in the 1800s, it was written in the 1800s. We said we weren't going to talk about Moby we Dick We are going to talk about it. But, like, it's a boat full of people of colour and the N-word is not used once in that book. So mm-hmm. would would you say, well, that's unrealistic? Like, it's, yeah. Well, people so, would say it's unrealistic, but mm. <laughs> you don't have to have it in there. No. No. But I, I do find it interesting that it wasn't actually used. So that that is actually kind of um, fascinating that it wasn't used once, but, yeah. Mm. Um. So is that all of the, the ones on your list, that's, Brayton? That's all that we've covered. I'm aware we're running out of time. I had mm. one really quick example yes, that sure. I saw, with, and again, I said I don't know if this works or not because I haven't tried yep, it myself, yep, yep. but apparently if you've got writer's block, change your font to Comic Sans. A whole bunch of people said all of a sudden because you're just because everyone thinks Comic Sans is the stupid, um, mm. you know, text font. Mm. It suddenly does something to your brain and makes you be able to write. And I, I like I was following a bunch of people on Tumblr who are very good writers who all like reblogged this piece of advice with the with the capitals going, How does this work? It works. <laughs> so I, well, I might try it myself and report yeah. back. But if anyone has heard that before, um, and if you know if it works, or if it doesn't, if it's complete bullcrap, let us know. <laughs> Well, my fun little trivia about Comic Sans, which I think Comic Sans gets a bit of undue hate. It does. Comic, I comic, that bad. comic Sans makes things fun. Yeah. But it's not a professional font. No, it's not. No. However, no. my bit of trivia about Comic Sans is it was actually 
if I'm remembering correctly, and this may be apocryphal, but I heard that it was actually made for um, people with dyslexia. And apparently, if you have dyslexia, Comic mm. Sans is much easier to read. I have heard that too. Mm. I don't know if it's accurate or not. Well, my wife has mild Someone dyslexia. Please tell us. Hmm. Yeah, my wife has um, a mild form of dyslexia, and she loves Comic Sans. Oh, okay. He finds Comic Sans much easier to read. But I would love if anyone out there has hers is very mild. But if anyone is does have a much more s- severe, is that the correct terminology? Mm. <laughs> I don't know. But anyone out there suffering from dyslexia wants to chime in and let us know if Comic Sans is actually easier. I would be really interested to hear. We could Google it, but that would be a bit too helpful. So no, we want, we, we <laughs> want content. We need engagement with our listeners. We're not here to provide you answers. You give us the answers. <laughs> I like hearing personal stories. That's yes, all. Yes, that is true. <laughs> all right. So if I think that'll probably do us for tonight. If there are any authors out there, I, we would love to hear what bad advice you've gotten. Please get in touch with us either on Facebook You can leave a comment under this episode when it gets posted. We're on Instagram. You can drop us an email at nothelpfulpod at gmail.com. Send a carrier pigeon. Um, (laughs) Hire a skywriter and just do it above the city. I do love it. It'll get back to us. Yes. Um, Are there any other archaic forms of communication? Message in a bottle. Oh, yes. One of us will be at the beach at some point. Pay a young boy to run very fast. To yep. us. Boxes. Um, yep. Boxes. <laughs> um, oh, Smoke telegrams? signals. Okay. Are telegrams still a thing? Singing telegrams. Oh, I Singing love telegram? Oh, oh, actually, that'd be a lot of fun. Strippergram. Strippergram. I'm open to a strippergram. All right. I think on that note then. <laughs> Just, Thank you very going. much for listening, everyone. Uh, yes, follow us on all of the socials and you can listen to us uh, where you get any of your podcasts. Yeah, I- Morse code. I just realized Morse code's another All one. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm Eloise. Joining me as always are. You can use secret codes in Renaissance paintings, then get Dan Brown to write a novel about it and then get your message to us that way. You do this every time. So invent time travel, <laughs> travel back in time, put a secret <laughs> message in a Renaissance painting, then leave clues for Dan Brown to write a novel about it. Thank you, Brayton and Julian. <laughs> it could work. Yes, I agree. All right. You'd be wrong. Prove it hasn't happened. Until next time, have fun reading, everyone, and we will see you in the future. Bye. Oh, how's that going to work? Is it going to get in contact with us through the future? Just say goodbye, Brian. (laughs)